All right. Hi, I'm Robert Steers. Um, if I can get started now, then let's start. Um, let's start rolling here. So uh, thanks for joining the talk, and I'm going to be discussing Monterey Pine uh, in colonization in Northern California and some implications for um, choosing species in uh, um, restoration. So next slide, please. So I'm not going to get into a lot of details on the natural history of Monterey Pine, but there's five natural populations. Um, three are in California at Año Nuevo, Monterey, and Cambria, and there's two off of the coast of Baja California on Guadalupe and Cedros Islands. And the picture at the uh, right side shows the average cone size at each of these uh, populations. So there's definitely some some differences between them. Um, they, there's no gene sharing among them naturally. Um, another interesting difference is that the, uh, the island pines off of Baja have two needles instead of three, like the uh, mainland California populations. So next slide, please. And uh, this is a, a map of the world showing some locations of Pinus radiata collected with iNaturalist. Um, one thing to to mention is that this is one of the most, if not the most highly planted pine tree in the world. And there's major um, uh, commercial operations in New Zealand, Australia, South America, um, and South Africa. And it, it's been planted, planted elsewhere as well. Um, and then along the California coast, um, similar to Monterey Cypress, um, it's been planted widely along the California coast. So you can see in the lower left-hand corner, there's some locations from uh, California there. Next slide. Here's a, a view of a plantation in New Zealand, just to give you some perspective on the, uh, the commercial side of the species. Uh, next slide, please. And today I'm going to be discussing um, some field work that was done in the Marin Headlands. Marin Headlands are located just north of San Francisco uh, in Southern Marin uh, County. Uh, and in this area, there's a matrix of uh, coastal scrub and grassland. So next slide, please. So you can see uh, that in this coastal scrub in the Marin Headlands, uh, there's quite a bit of uh, Monterey pine colonization into these areas. And the trees vary, vary in size. So next slide, please. Here's just another example um, showing one large tree and, and multiple smaller trees um, nearby. Uh, next slide, please. So in this study, what we wanted to do was look at the impacts of Monterey pine colonization on coastal scrub. So we selected trees that varied in size from really small trees to the largest on the landscape. And we sampled in half meter square quadrats underneath um, on the downhill and the uphill side of the tree in the scrub habitat, and then in two frames outside of the influence of the tree. And we collected data like species richness and cover by species, um, pine canopy coverage and pine litter um, depth and, and coverage. Next slide. So what we found out was pretty intuitive and what we expected. Um, if you, you may, may or may not be able to see what's on the x-axis at the bottom, but um, the x-axis is increasing tree basal diameter if you can't see it. And so what, what we measured was that as the trees um, grow larger and larger, there's more canopy coverage um, above those quadrats that are under the trees and there's more litter coverage, um, which is, you know, as you would expect, right? Uh, the trees just get bigger and uh, there's more shade and there's more litter. Uh, and then when we're looking at the plots that were under the trees, um, again, looking at native uh, parameters like species richness and shrub cover, what we also saw was that shrub cover decreased with increasing um, tree size and, and so did richness. So just underneath these trees and the vegetation that's getting overtopped or seeing you know, strong changes in the vegetation as the trees get bigger and exert more and more influence on that vegetation. Uh, next slide, please. Great, so in this slide, we have um, data from, the, from outside of the trees in gray and data from under the trees in, in black. 
and we split this data up into three size classes of trees. So again, this illustrates that in the smallest trees, the differences um, between the uncolonized and colonized scrub it is low. It's not signif statistically significant. And then as you get into the medium and the, high, the large tree classes, do you get significant differences? So, so overall, we were able to, to demonstrate that um, this species uh, exerts like a really strong uh, impact on the uh, structure and composition of the coastal scrub that it invades. Um, so now let's talk about the conservation challenges facing Monterey pine. Uh, so this species is listed as a, a 1B.1 ranking by CNPS, and CNPS lists some of the big threats as development, forest fragmentation, genetic contamination, um, and impacts from pine pitch canker. And then on Guadalupe Island, there's browsing by feral goats that have really um, hammered the population on that island. Uh, next slide, please. Great, and so of course, like, um, other species in California, climate change is also um, going to be an impacting uh, variable for, for the persistence um, of the species and its current locations. Um, and so right now what we have is a, a special status species, right, that's facing a lot of big challenges. Um, most of them are from, you know, the traditional uh, areas that have impacted, um, you know, habitats and species in California. And, and now we have you know, a whole nother level of complexity on top of that. So one of the questions you might ask is, well, why not let this you know, CNPS list 1B.1 species that's you know, doing well in, in the Marin headlands, why don't we just let it flourish and, and that can be a new population of the species? Um, why why um, you know, sh shine a, a bad light on this or you know, um, take the approach that the species needs to get removed? And so there's several criteria to consider in that regard. And number one are the land management goals, um, as you can see on this slide. So right now the goals are to maintain high quality scrub and grassland that exists on the site. And another major goal is to um, avoid impacts to any existing special status species. And as our data shows, this would you know, run counter the, to those two goals um, in a major way. Uh, if we allow this tree to occur on the site, um, it would type convert the area to um, close cone pine forest and uh, dramatically change a lot of ecosystem processes. Uh, next. One minute. Next up is genetic diversity. So unfortunately the existing trees are believed to be cultivars de derived from New Zealand um, and the diversity is assumed to be low and unrepresentative of natural populations. So again, this is, um, this is a no-go. Um, if we were really concerned about the um, the genetic diversity of the species and protecting that in perpetuity, we would have to eliminate all of these cultivars from the landscape and then introduce new Pinus radiata individuals, you know, using modern conservation genetics and a lot of the insights that the other speakers have discussed. Next. Uh, another big one, especially these days, are fire regime changes. So moving from um, vegetation that's grassland and scrub based to a dense forest um, would radically alter the fire regime um, and there would have to be not only uh, pre preparations uh, on the management side but acceptance by the surrounding community. Next. Uh, also in terms of pine pitch canker which is listed as a threat the pathogen is present in this area um, so to get around that one would have to you know, apply disease management techniques to, to deal with that, um, that disease on the site. Next. Uh, last, I just wanna say that this is a special status species. So even though one would be introducing it to somewhere new, um, just because one is introducing it, you'd, you still have to treat it with um, all the protections that normal special status species are afforded. Um, and so this would definitely uh, result in, in more time and money spent um, dealing with uh, this species and for the right reasons, but it'd just be something that one would have to be aware of prior to introducing special status species into someplace new. And next. The last two areas are, are great. Um, if we did want to introduce Pinus radiata here, uh, the land is protected in perpetuity. Uh, 
it's contiguous. Um, so um, from that perspective, it would meet the criteria. And then uh, the site also seems to be suitable uh, for future climate conditions. Um, that's just an assumption, but from those two criteria, we, we seem to be good. So I just wanted to highlight um, that this species, although it's native, um, it, it is a cultivar and it, it does have major impacts on the vegetation that it colonizes. Um, and two, anytime we're thinking about introducing a native species somewhere new, um, besides just these, these genetic questions, um, there's a lot of site-specific management um, questions that need to be addressed you know, in addition to the genetic diversity. Um, so thanks, that's the presentation. And, uh, My name's Patricia Maloney and I'm with UC Davis and the Tahoe Environmental Research Center. And again, I wanna thank you, um, the CMPS, um, for inviting me to speak today. So I'll be talking about amplifying within population resilience to drought in the Lake Tahoe Basin and talking about survivors that emerge from the drought and a climate-driven outbreak by bark beetles. Next slide. So from 2012 to 2016, drought and bark beetles killed more than 126 million trees in California and 72,000 in the Lake Tahoe Basin, primarily on the north, um, on the north shore, on very south-facing slopes and um, steep south-facing slopes and also steep terrain. Next slide. So I'm gonna focus on the figure on the left and looking at the interactions between drought and bark beetles. And on the upper panel, we have precipitation and then on the lower panel, we have um, soil moisture. And so all of the gray bars are the sort of active growing season length and the drought of 2012 to 2016 was flanked by two really big water years in 2011 and 2017. And in the ovals in green, if you look at the soil moisture in 2011 and 2017, you know, at the start of the growing season, soil moisture was ample. But if you look at the soil moisture in 2012 to 2016, you could see that at the start of the growing season, soil moisture was pretty, pretty low in all of those five years. Next slide. So interactions between drought and bark beetles. So bark beetles such as mountain pine beetle are known to preferentially attack drought stressed trees. And trees have a physical base defense by producing resin. So the picture on the far right has a pitch tube um, that's trying to, that it mobilizes resources. And you know, when it's being attacked, you know, it'll pitch basically the bark beetle out. And what was striking about the drought and the mountain pine beetle killed trees or sugar pines in the Tahoe Basin was that I would say about over 90% of the sugar pine trees that were dead from mountain pine beetle did not have any evidence of pitch tubes on them. So host chemistry can also defend against bark beetle attacks or it can also aid in locating a suitable host. So when trees such as those here in the Sierra were drought stressed, they can emit chemicals such as ethylene, and that can, can signal tree vulnerability and detection by bark beetles such as mountain pine beetle. Next slide. In 2016, our lab cored from 100 live and 100 mountain pine beetle killed sugar pine trees to conduct basically a retrospective analysis of, their, of water use efficiency. So we went back about 90 years and we chose um, four different time periods in which we collected those annual rings from 1930 to 35, 1960 to 1965, and 1990 to 1995, and then 2009 to 2014. Next slide. Ooh, didn't come out. So the box, box and whisker plot, plots, they, um, the 
in the groups of two, the one on the left is are those that are the hundred are the live sugar pine trees, and the ones on the right are the dead sugar pine trees. If that is clear with everybody. Um, I had them colors green. It was supposed to be green on the left and red on the right. So drought stress and susceptibility to mountain pine beetle. So sugar pine trees that were more water use efficient and perhaps better adapted to drought survived the recent mountain pine beetle outbreak. And those are the ones, like I said, all of the, the bars on the left-hand side. And in contrast, those that were killed by mountain pine beetle utilize their water less efficiently. So trees under high drought stress often have reduced host defenses, defenses to bark beetle attack. So not only do they not have display that sort of physical defense in producing resin, but also ethylene production begins to kick in when they are that drought stressed. Um, I'm gonna skip these next two slides to stay on my time queue. Go to the next one. Thanks. So going back to the title of my talk, amplifying, oh, back to the first one <laughs> or the next one. Sorry, thank you. So in 2017, we collected from 100 local and diverse sugar pine trees in the Lake Tahoe Basin. And essentially, they were drought survivors. Next slide. So in 2019 and 2020, my lab and the California Conservation Corps, we outplanted the progeny of those 100 local and diverse sugar pine trees, essentially trees that survived drought and a mountain pine beetle outbreak. And this was featured in the, new, in the LA Times back in November of 2019. And I consider our approach as assisted regeneration of these local and diverse seed sources. Next slide. And so a few years ago, we, my colleagues and I um, ran three common garden experiments for the three five needle white pines in the Tahoe Basin, sugar pine, Western white pine, and white bark pine. And like I said, they were, we did a common garden to look at genetic variation and phenotypic variation of these three white pines in the Tahoe Basin. Um, and we measured a variety of traits and we also determined relationships between these traits and their environment of their source locations. And so what we found for sugar pine, which is highlighted in the panel, in the panels below, is that we had significant variation in, you know, phenotypic variation in height growth, bud flush, root to shoot ratio, um, the 13C, which is uh, the carbon stable isotope ratio, which is a meta measure of water use efficiency, as well as nitrogen content. And what was striking is that, you know, climate is always used as sort of like, as the, driving factor for a lot of this phenotypic variation that we see in tree populations. But with our work, soil, climate, and geography, um, each individually in the upper right um, figure, each individually explain a lot about the variation for these particular traits, but also the combination of all three um, explain a lot. Of, of the phenotypic variation for particular traits in all three species. And what's interesting is that geography um, takes into account, particularly here in the Tahoe Basin, we have not only a precipitation gradient as you go move from the crest on the west side over to the Carson Range on the east side, but you also have um, sort of a start, start um, contrast in soil types, and that is that on the east shore of Tahoe, we have largely granitic soils, and then on the sort of north and west shore, we have largely andesitic or volcanic soils. Next slide. Okay. 
Was there a question? One minute. So the current work that we're doing now is we are currently um, scientifically studying those survivors or winners. Um, so those hundred trees that we collected from, we actually are getting set up to put in a common garden and we're gonna measure traits such as water use efficiency, um, disease resistance to white pine blister rust, growth, stomatal conductance, resource allocation, and chemical defense will be one of those sort of important traits that we actually do measure. And so in closing, um, this paper that appeared in, I think, 2018, Who Should Pick the Winners of Climate Change, um, really resonated with me. And I'm going to just read the, the final um, statement in the abstract. By designing actions to, fac to facilitate numerous opportunities for selection across biological and environmental conditions, we can allow nature to pick winners and increase the probability that ecosystems continue to provide services to humans and other species. And so I'm a strong um, supporter of planting out local and diverse seed sources when doing restoration plantings. Next slide. And thank you everyone for your time. And um, again, thank you to the California Native Plant Society for asking me to speak today. Hi, I'm Christina Schoenbeck, professor at Chico State, and I've been working for years on hybridization. Um, and today I'm going to talk a little more broadly about some of the issues associated with hybridization, both between species and between uh, within species uh, between populations next. <clears throat> Some of the issues that um, have been discussed and I think will be discussed in more detail this afternoon are that of course we need genetic variation for species to be able to respond to natural selection and that non-local genotypes may not have those adaptations. And when we um, introduce non-local genotypes where there are local genotypes, uh, hybridization between those populations can lead to outbreeding depression and hybrid breakdown. There is increasing evidence, although we need a lot more, that local genotypes generally have a higher fitness and restoration. And in extreme cases, um, with a few species, we've seen that native genotypes can actually be lost through hybridization. Next. Uh, we also know that um, in many cases, cultivars of native plant species are being developed and are becoming increasingly popular in the horticultural trade. But um, there's also evidence that they don't, in some cases, provide the ne necessary uh, ecosystem characteristics for things like pollinators. As humans, we love to disturb the environment, and this also encourages hybridization. And again, at the other end of the spectrum, rather than um, discourage hybridization between local and non-local genotypes, sometimes assisted gene flow can facilitate populations that have very natural low levels of variation. Next. In this slide, if we look on the x-axis, we can see natural levels of gene flow um, in plant populations. So we have everywhere from uh, low natural gene flow, this would be a naturally um, sp very specific habitat um, species or uh, very specific pollinators to um, generalist pollinator populations or wind pollinated species that have high levels of gene flow. On the y-axis, we can see that population size will also influence the amount of gene flow that's going to happen among populations. So if we have a very small population size with low uh, natural gene flow, um, there may be an, a desire to reduce inbreeding depression, but there's also a fairer risk of outbreeding depression. So experimental evidence is really important in cases like this. Um, sometimes maybe a species rather than the introduction of uh, additional genotypes may just need demographic support. On the other hand, and we see this in the upper right corner, kind of the peach colored area, plants that um, have large populations and high levels of gene flow probably are not going to be affected much by the introduction of non-local genotypes. Next. Next. 
So um, there are a number of cases where species hybridize with natives. I'm going to talk specifically today about uh, Western sycamore, Platinus racemosa, under threat from hybridization with London plane tree. Um, and, but there, and we have cases of widespread species like Achillea millifolium and Schultzia californica, which um, may be under threat from non-local cultivars that are being spread by well-meaning um, but misguided uh, plant enthusiasts. And in the case of millifolium, there is evidence that some pollinators will not respond to certain cultivars. Any of the cultivars that are being developed are species that are usually um, have a high propensity for hybridization. So species shown here on the bottom, we see that, um, that these cultivars get introduced in if one lives at the urban wildland interface or there's a restoration project near the rural urban wildland interface, it's really important to use native uh, genotypes and not cultivars next. I'm going to talk today about riparian forests, which are, as you know, um, vastly reduced since European colonization. About 5% of the uh, extent remains. And of that 5%, uh, it's heavily degraded. One of the co dominants of the riparian forest of California is Platinus racemosa. Next. <clears throat> And it was noticed um, in a restoration effort by the Nature Conservancy that a number of hybrids were uh, volunteering along the Sacramento River in the northern Sacramento Valley that were not planted. Next. So our goals um, given to us were to identify source populations for restoration efforts. Seeds are not reliable because of this wind pollinated species may have been contaminated through hybridization. So first we had to develop molecular markers and then uh, we set out to determine the extent of hybridization and the age structure of the hybrid invasion next. So the story is that uh, Platinus hispanica, formerly known as Platinus acerifolia, was developed in England in the 17th century between a hybrid of Platinus orientalis and Platinus occidentalis. And the London plane tree was introduced throughout uh, Europe and North America and became very popular as a horticultural tree due to its very straight uh, growth and rapid growth. When it was introduced into California, however, and also on the East Coast and in Central Asia, it was noticed that it back crosses with um, parental or related species. Next. So this is just showing uh, the pair on the top row, the parents, Occidentalis from Eastern North America, Orientalis from Central Asia, and then Hispanica in the middle, and then on the bottom, just some of the variation that you, one can observe through the hybrids in the field. Next. What's remarkable about this case is that unlike uh, most California um, taxa, which are separated by it seems weeks in terms of evolutionary time, um, the lineages that are uh, hybridizing in this case are as old as 50 million years uh, to 20 million years, yet we see no barriers to um, reproductive isolation among these taxa. Next. So we set out to test uh, hybridization, did a lot of leaf sampling in and around Chico and Red Bluff. Um, we used age as a proxy for, I mean, DBH as a proxy for age. And we uh, GPS recorded each individual and did microsatellite analysis next. We did all the appropriate uh, statistics to separate these individuals. Um, there's a paper out, Johnson et al. 19 or 2017, if those are, if you're interested in the detail. So next, and I'm just going to show one picture of the um, results that I think summarizes it pretty well. Next, and this is showing 
Um, in the upper left, the age class, uh, the oldest age class, which is as old as 200 years old, we see mostly um, racemosa hybrid or individuals shown in blue. Uh, back one, please. Um, we see a one hybrid individual in that age class. And as we go down in age classes, we see through um, these principal component analysis where each dot represents a, um, a, com a, um, a uh, combined uh, identity, genetic identity for an individual. Again, blue racemosa, pink is Hispanica, and the white are hybrids between Hispanica and racemosa. We can see in the younger age classes on the lower right that um, hybridization is becoming a serious problem in Platonist racemosa. Next. So uh, we do see that the hybridization has resulted in increased diversity in platinus. We know that they're likely to be younger. Um, it seems as though the hybridization has been continuing since um, the uh, Hispanica arrived. And um, there are likely fitness consequences, very difficult to measure in a woody species. But we do know that there are ecosystem effects due to differences in form. Um, Acer, or excuse me, Hispanica. Don't, doesn't seem to have as much ecosystem value as racemosa, which, as you know, forms multiple trunks and will um, combine, I mean, twist in maturity to become um, habitat for small mammals and raptors. Another project very different that we're working on, um, we don't have much data yet. We have some preliminary uh, RADSEQ data on this, and this is um, everybody's favorite California native California, or Darlingtonia Californica. And we do have data that indicates that um, there are three genetic clusters present throughout Northern California that um, also coincide with historically proposed subspecies. Because this species is so incredibly habitat specific, we're concerned about climate change, the loss of some of those habitats, and which populations may be appropriate should assisted gene flow be necessary in the future. Next. So um, in general, we know that local genotypes, whether uh, at the species level or the subspecies or the population level, generally form, perform better in restoration. We know that ecosystem function can be altered through gene flow. We also need more information. And although there's a lot of work being done on seed provenances in economically important species, very little has been done on um, non-economically uh, cases. Uh, genetic res rescue, the antithesis of, of the warning of against local and non-local genotypes may be appropriate in some cases, but these would be, I think, only in extreme cases. And the last recommendation would be, if you live near an urban wildland interface, please think twice about planting cultivars. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks. Hello, my name is Jessica Wright and I'm a research geneticist with the USDA Forest Service. And I wanna start by thanking the CNPS for the invitation to speak today. And I wanna thank Kristen for that great introduction. Her uh, conclusion slide is the great segue just right into my talk. I'm gonna be talking about provenance tests and including some on non-economically um, non important species. So um, I've been working with folks from CAL FIRE looking at the California seed zone map and looking at seed transfer here in California. This is our team from CAL FIRE. They're funding this project, um, working with Chris Anthony and Stuart McMarlow and Anthony Luke and reforestation here in Davis, as well as Jim Thorne, jo Joseph Stewart, Ryan, and Michelle at UC Davis. Um, and the goals of our project are to look at the California seed zone map. I have a picture of it there. It was established in the 1970s. There's a great paper that describes it by Buck et al. <clears throat> and we want to think about, it's a map, it's geographically based, so how does this map work in a cl changing climate? In the 1970s when it was drawn, uh, climate change was not something anyone was talking about. Also, I think it's important to point out that we only have one uh, sea zone map for all of California, so every, or all, all species, so all species, all tree species in California are assumed to work the same using this map. Uh, can I get the next slide, please? 
So today I'm gonna to be talking about seed transfer in California and how we can best and most effectively use the California seed zone map. And to do that, we, we want information, we want data. So I'm gonna be focusing on provenance tests, which are common gardens of trees, um, often trees, but in, in this case, we'll be talking about trees. Um, it's a gold standard for testing how trees grow in a novel climate. And the question I'm gonna be answering, asking today is how do trees perform in these new environments and are there differences in performance or traits associated with the home environment of where the trees came from? And I'm gonna focus on two sets of tests, one in Valley Oak, Crocus Nevada, and one uh, looking at a meta-analysis across a large number of conifer species and tests across Western, the Western US. Can I get, uh, perfect. Okay, so um, this is the Valley Oak Provenance Test team. Uh, my Victoria Sork is my major collaborator at UCLA. Uh, Chris Ivey's been uh, really helpful at uh, Chico State. We've been uh, working with a lot of his students there. Uh, and you'll see some of their data coming up. Luke Brown uh, was a postdoc with Victoria and Courtney Canning's a botanist at um, the Institute of Forest Genetics with the Pacific Southwest Research Station. So Valley Oaks, as probably most of you know, were already highly impacted by human activity, including housing and agriculture. And they're anticipated to be highly impacted by climate change. And another important thing, um, especially when I give talks to uh, lots of pine people, um, acorns cannot be stored long-term. You can't uh, gather an acorn and stick it in the freezer and expect it to grow. Um, they have to be planted pretty short off. So um, provenance tests serve as resource, resource research sources, but they also serve a conservation function as well. Next slide, please. So in 2014, we established the Valley Oak Provenance Test. We collected uh, acorns from 674 maternal trees and 95 sites. We planted over about 20,000 acorns in two days uh, in Placerville at the Institute of Forest Genetics. And then they got planted out into the field into common gardens. Can I get the next slide? So 2014, we planted at the Institute of Forest Genetics. It was a little bit of a rush job because there was this giant storm that was coming and we had to get the trees in. So we were working with headlamps as fast as we could to get the trees in. There are 3,500 trees at each site and you can see the 2014 planting and then what they look like this summer in 2020 at the Institute of Forest Genetics. The trees, the second planting site is in Chico at the Chico Seed Orchard. And those trees, I tell you, are two to three times bigger than the trees you're seeing here. These trees are probably two to three meters tall and the ones in Chico are five to six to eight meters tall. Um, the data I'm gonna be talking about today is uh, bud burst data. We're looking at um, the date of first bud break. Again, we had folks go out every week to those trees and survey each tree uh, for the stage of bud burst. And this is an important trait because this timing of bud burst is important to maximize the use of the growing season. That is, if a, earlier a tree bursts bud, the longer they're gonna have to photosynthesize and grow um, during the growing season. On the other hand, if they're in a place that's uh, subject to late frosts, that might be some damage. And we have in fact seen that at IFG, some of the trees that leaf out early get hit by frost later on. So it's really important for trees um, to adapt well to their environment to have an appropriate timing out of their leaf burst. Also interestingly in oaks, uh, leafing out when the trees get older is also correlated with when the, the flowers leaf, the flowers open very closely to when the, the buds burst. So it has that, that aspect as well. So this is our data from this test. Um, the first, the date of first bud break is um, the X axis. So the bigger that number, the later the bud burst. The mean annual temperature uh, is the temperature of the environment where the acorn was collected from. And you'll see the black dots are IFG and the white triangles are the trees growing at Chico. And first of all, you'll see the trees that from warmer places leaf out earlier than trees from cooler places. The number is, the, the line goes down on the y-axis when the numbers get larger on the x-axis. Now, um, you'll also see that the slope, that the two lines for the two sites are different. You see the, the black line for IFG is higher than the dotted line for Chico. That suggests that the trees from Chico are leafing out, are leafing out uh, earlier than the trees from IFG. But you also notice those slopes are slightly different, which suggests there's a genotype by environment interaction. That is, it's the genotype that's driving this changes, this differences in bud burst based on the temperature where they came from. But you'll see that at the two sites, those two things are slightly different. And I'm ready for the next slide. So now we're gonna talk about work uh, that was done by uh, Luke Brown, uh, working with uh, Victoria Sork at UCLA as part of this project as well, looking at the same trees. And um, so we've talked about traits in terms of the pheno phenological traits, and he looked at growth. So more of a, a fitness-based um, trait of how, 
how well they're actually doing. And he looked at uh, the growth for the first four years of the experiment. Now on the left is our hypothesis. If the trees that are from the same place, the same climate are gonna perform best, then that blue line is gonna be what happens. That is the trees where the climate was not at all different from where they were collected versus where they were planted have the fastest growth and trees from more and more different places have, slow, have less and less growth. If there's adaptational lag, that is the trees are adapted to a different climate, then we're going to see a shift in that line. For example, where trees, when they're planted into cooler areas have better performance. The graph on the right shows what we actually saw. Hang on, I'm gonna need that slide still. And um, the graph on the right shows what we actually saw and that is that trees in fact perform much better their environment than warmer environments, suggesting we do see adaptational lag in these trees uh, because the, the ones that come from the same climate do not perform best at the two planting sites. Now we'll take the next slide, which is just a quick transition to go from oaks to conifers. And the following slide shows the work that our postdoc, Joe Stewart, has been working on. He's been gathering up data from different conifer tests um, across the US and Canada. In, we're going to talk today about five different species. I believe his analyses now are up to over 10 species. The red dots here show places where seeds were collected from and the blue circles show places where trees were planted in each of these different species. And we're going to be looking at that same hypothesis that Luke was looking at with the valley oaks, looking to see if trees from the local environment are performing better than trees from uh, a colder environment. So the next slide shows our results. And the point of this, this first slide, uh, the first graph to the left is just to show that Joe's looked at a lot of data. There are a lot of points on that graph. The y-axis is showing the relative volume. He created that measure to be able to compare all of these different tests and planting sites and species. So he calculated the relative volume per hectare for each of these test sites. He compared that to the change of where the trees came from. Please. This slide is specially designed to direct your attention to what's critically important in this figure. Hit the next slide. And you'll see that the, the curves, okay, so I've, I've put in just in, as in Luke's figure, the dotted line showing zero, and you will see that in fact, uh, the, the trees at that zero line are not the best performers. That line is, the, the curves are all slightly shifted to the left. That is trees planted in colder places are performing better than trees planted um, back into environments more similar to their home environment. And that's seen both in this curve and then in the, in the bar graph above, you can see that, that amount of adaptational lag. Interestingly, you'll see variation in the size of the error bars on that graph. And that actually is associated directly with how many uh, trees were involved in the different experiments. And the tests with the larger number of trees have the smaller um, error bars. Okay, at the next slide. These results are really important for, uh, important for the, uh, Thinking about it, what happens uh, if we don't move seeds to match the climate? And the x-axis here is showing the difference between the optimal climate, optimal mean annual temperature and, and, a, and a planted one using the data from these tests. And you'll see that if uh, we miss by about two degrees Celsius, we see about a 13, 14% change decrease in volume in those planting sites. If the temperature is off by three degrees, we see a 25% decrease in vol volume per hectare uh, resulting from, again, from the data from these tests show that that's what, what is going on if you miss by three degrees. Hit the next slide, please. So these are my take home messages. Um, California Seed Zone Map has been used since the 1970s as a guide for seed transfer here in California for reforestation projects. We have one map for all species. And because it's a map, there's no way to account for a changing climate. Um, working with CAL FIRE, you, the Forest Service, UC Davis, and the USGS, we're exploring how seed transfer using the map will be impacted by a changing climate. And work in provenance tests is shedding light on how trees respond to novel climates. Uh, we're looking at leaf emergence in the spring, and growth performance are both uh, influenced by the climate of where trees came from. And we're hopeful these results will help inform seed transfer in California and maximize the use of seeds stored in the CAL FIRE and US Forest Service seed banks, as well as oak reforestation projects. And I want to put a plug for a talk later this afternoon. Jim Thorne, my collaborator on the CAL FIRE project, will be talking about climate and I think a little bit about this project later. So thank you very much. Um, my next slide is a thank you slide for many of the folks who are involved in the OAK project. And I thank you for your attention.